Welcome to our Foundations of Interpersonal Neurobiology webinar. We are so thrilled to have you here this evening and have a lot to discuss. So we're going to dive right in. I have with me this evening Mari Alexander and Maureen Lowell. Maureen is uh, on her own screen here, but so thrilled to have two of our wonderful interpersonal neurobiology instructors with us. Uh, they come with a wealth of knowledge as do all of our instructors. Uh, my name is Amy Evans. I am the coordinator for, the, uh, for several of our programs at the Institute for Health Professionals, but one of my favorites is our in, uh, in, <laughs> interpersonal neurobiology uh, program. And I will let, um, would you like to introduce yourself, sure. Mari? Sure, I'm Mari Alexander and I'm a licensed marriage family therapist here in Portland. Um, and I'm also a medical provider and a um, cultural competency and conscious bias person. So I clearly like, I'm in, involved in different things and I'd like to bring them together and make them meaningful for people. I'm also the mom, mother of three sons. Uh, two of them, I would say, are grown up, and the third one is, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> A work in progress. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Maureen, parent as well, and also licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, would you share a little more about yourself, please? Yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. So I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in, Ca in California and in Oregon, and, uh, but not currently practicing. Um, I am an instructor at um, San Jose State where I teach in the Justice Studies Department and uh, teach the family and community violence and teach collaboration. Um, and um, I do other work in... Uh, collaboration in the family violence field. I um, am a domestic violence specialist, and I, so I use this in training and consulting as well. So um, probably a big emphasis that comes out of that whole whole picture is collaboration, ha working with people to work across disciplines to more be more effective in addressing our more complex social issues. Fantastic. Thank mm -hmm. you. I can so appreciate the work that both of you do. Uh, I started my career with working in nonprofits and creating community collaborations around prevention services. Yeah. Uh, I also have a background as a uh, licensed massage therapist and an energy practitioner and uh, then workforce development and mm -hmm. a lot of program planning and training. So uh, this work is really near and dear to my heart and I know that it can make a really big yeah. impact in the world. So the other thing I did want to add since, uh, since Mari's got three sons, I should add that I have three daughters. So we've kind of got the Brady Bunch here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and on all three are, are grown and working their way into their professional lives. But, uh, but that too, I think is very relevant when we think about interpersonal neurobiology is that it isn't the profession, it is the whole person that, uh, that comes to this program. Absolutely. Yeah. Very much. Thank you. Well, let's dive into the, the topic at hand here. Uh, what is interpersonal neurobiology? Uh, Maureen, would you feel comfortable starting us off? Sure. Um, you know, I was thinking about what is interpersonal neurobiology, and when we start talking about that, we so quickly get into our jargon and our <laughs> IPNB speak. So, um, I, you know, I was interested in these um, two definitions just to give us a jumping off place to start to deconstruct what is interpersonal neurobiology, why is it unique, and why is it helpful for people of, of diverse um, backgrounds and disciplines and, and perspectives? How how is it that it contributes to a shared knowledge that can then branch out into the different ways it gets uh, applied? And so um, the first is a uh, quote here is by Dan Siegel, who some would consider the father of interpersonal neurobiology. Um, but really it was Dan Siegel and um, Lou Cozzolino and um, um, Alan Shore that came together, I, I think, and what people would consider the beginning of this you know, movement, this field, this framework. And But Dan Siegel says he, that, Interpersonal neurobiology is a consilient field, and we're gonna come back to that, but a consilient field that embraces all branches of science as it seeks the common universal findings across independent ways of knowing in order to understand or uh, expand our understanding of the mind and well-being. And I think this captures where Dan comes um, into this field with a real focus on the mind and well-being as the integration 
of the brain and the mind in relationships and bringing together the science. And I think that's a critical differentiation from what interpersonal neurobiology is from, from many other ways of approaching some of these same concepts um, is that this is looking at the sciences and how they contribute to this understanding of mind and relationships and uh, uh, sorry, the brain and relationships and the emerging mind. And then the second one, I think, um, kind of rounds out a little bit more what interpersonal neurobiology is, and that comes from Lou Cozzolino, um, who says that interpersonal neurobiology is among the emerging fields that are attempting to bridge the gap between biological and social sciences, that they're not so distinctly different anymore. They are distinct, they each contribute, but there becomes this convergence that is very um, informative about helping us understand how we are and where we are in the world. So he says interpersonal neurobiology is the study of how we attach, grow, and interconnect throughout our lives. And so you see this developmental perspective along the life course, um, but also this idea that we're bringing together um, the science of brain and mind and relationships in, in interpersonal neurobiology. Thank you. Yeah. Mai, did you have anything you wanted to add? We'll talk more about it on the next slide. I, I think this really says it. So Great. yeah, let's go on. Okay. Uh, so among many things, interpersonal neurobiology is a consilient approach. Um, as Maureen mentioned, it really bridges a lot of areas and things. Um, uh, what, would, uh, what would that mean to you, the consilient approach to interpersonal neurobiology? Wow. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, no, I think the whole idea of bridging and integration is the most important piece, and that it really is taking aspects of um, many different aspects of science and social science and coming together to create uh, a more cohesive, whole-minded, whole-body-minded uh, approach to, um, to life. So starting with attachment um, and then working up in terms of relationships, how trauma impacts us, how our cultures, all those things impact us. Um, and then with that, um, how, what we can do in terms of if there is not well-being, how we can work again with that bridge and with the integration to have the lives that we want to have or with our clients or our patients or our families, whoever it is. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. Maureen, do you have uh, anything to add or a different perspective on how you work with that? Oh, I think you might be muted there. Yeah, with the conciliated approach you're asking? Yes. That we were asking? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the word conciliant gets into what's critical to the field, and that is that multiple sciences come to similar conclusions. Right. And it's the intersection of those conclusions that really illuminate um, a way of knowing that um, gives us a foundation for understanding not only what that one science brings, but what we can learn by realizing that different sciences are coming to the same conclusions, but then allow it, us to apply it in ways um, that um, you know, make it even more robust. So if physics finds um, that, you know, the way we are and how we measure the world is distinguished between quantum and, you know, the ways we know the worlds in Newton's theories, for instance, but that comes together with Eastern philosophy and all of a sudden we're talking about how mindfulness is something that becomes embodied in our consciousness, just to give two extreme uh, differences, um, it brings us together as people um, in an ecology and an understanding of who we are and where we are in the world that I think is quite unique. So I think that the idea that they're bringing science, not just philosophy and ideas, but actual science and findings together to say we're coming to common ground on findings, even though we're approaching them from different directions, to me was probably one of the things that really got me excited about this field. Great, thank you. I have, I have this image in my mind of all these streets coming in, mm -hmm. come into this center intersection, but the intersection is made up of much more than the streets. That mm. there's, a, there's like a combustion that happens when mm -hmm. you actually bring them all together mm -hmm. that um, gives us a whole different meaning. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I think that that <clears throat> brings up one of, one of the things that I think is important is that the interpersonal neurobiology really focuses on the idea that things emerge. It's less linear. And so even if, if a science brings findings in a linear fashion, by bringing them together, as you're describing, you end up with an emergence uh, emergent property that can't be described by the streets themselves or the vehicles that got us there or the findings that are, are the facts, but rather it, it comes into a way of understanding that is is beyond any single um, contribution to that. And I think, you know, we talked about collaboration. I think that's what we see when minds come together on a complex issue is that we come with, up with new ways of approaching problems that we're actually living now as we see technology explode floating, you know, there's things we never really fully imagined, except maybe the Jetsons, but <laughs> aside from them. Yeah, so no, I think that that's, um, that's an exciting way that all these different sciences come together in, um, in interpersonal neurobiology. Yeah, thank Great. you. Yeah, as we look at this meta framework uh, for illuminating theories and models, we're putting a lot of uh, theories together within this framework, mm -hmm. uh, or this multi- framework. Um, what are some of the theories and, and models that, that you find the most, uh, that you draw from the most in, in your life and work? Uh, Maureen, can I toss that one to you? Um, so, sure. Um, I would... The contributions uh, to IPMB. Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, obviously at a really fundamental level, we're talking about neuroscience um, and, you know, kind of there is a, is that is an exploding um, area of study that so not that we know all the answers, but rather there are new findings that are really contributing to our understanding. Um, and you, you take break that down into biology and chemistry and physics. So we have those basics. But for me, too, there's two theories that really um, are critical for understanding interpersonal neurobiology it is the way I see it is that complexity theory is critical and attachment. So when and, and that was really helpful to me to get into, you know, the um, complex, adapt, uh, complex adaptive systems to get into complexity theory a bit, you know, not into a deep dive. I don't know the math of it, certainly. But when you understand complexity means that parts are coming together and interacting and reacting in ways that have this emergence, these emerging properties that cannot be predicted nor explained by the analysis of the parts. It helps us to hold things a lot more lightly. It helps us to move away from this linear um, idea that things can be compartmentalized and explained. And I think we're just coming into a new way of being um, as, as, as humans and being able to see things with more complexity now that complexity theory all of a sudden is attainable for people to hold the idea that we can't explain everything in a linear model. We can't explain everything by parts. We have to have almost a faith that the emergent property is one that we need to be open to. And that in seeing what emerges, it tells us more um, about what's being contributed um, in a great way, you know, and yet we also see that it can emerge in negative ways. And, you know, and I think we see that in some of the hate emerging and some of the, the negative things that we see parts coming together can be better understood by their relationships. And that's what interpersonal neurobiology really gives us. And then you add that to the very um, literal, literal contributions of attachment theory, where we start with the development of, um, of, of the fetus and the brain development. But then as, a, as that, that you know, new person emerges into life, we have the basic attachment um, and that the critical nature of how relationships are what continue the development of the human being into this collective being. And, um, I, you know, I think you add attachment then to complexity theory and, and you get to the crux of, of what I think IPNB has to offer and uniquely. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> well put. Yeah. yeah. Anything you'd like to add? Um, well, I'll, I had lots of thoughts, <laughs> but um, sure. just so one thing. that. that. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot in there. Um, one of the things that I think is so exciting about this is that when we look at, for instance, technology, and we think things are developing now that we didn't even imagine 10 years ago. And so I feel like IPNB is all about, can we even begin to imagine what might be unfolding? And that there's always an infinite sense of there's more out there. And with IPNB, there, there's 
there's room for there to be more out there. So I think that's, that's one of the things that's very exciting. One of the other things when we're talking about teaming across different disciplines or cultures or silos, whatever, whatever it is, that there's a way in which um, Dan Siegel also talks about the idea of there's something that happens when people come together and they, you know, there's a resonance, there's a, oh, oh, I get it, I get it, that happens and then there's a, there's a very powerful entity that's happening in the room. So interpersonally between the people and it's, you can't, you can't tear, take it apart, tear it apart. So I think that that's very unique to interpersonal neurobiology. And the attachment part, it's amazing to me how attachment um, actually can shift brains, shift neurons, and how you can also, um, I'm trying not to use too much of the IPNB jargon because that's <laughs> not helpful, but how you can actually remedy some of the difficulties with attachment through attachment later on in life that will give you um, a more robust ability to, for intimacy. And, you know, the story of the 92 year old man who learns about empathy, mm. you know, it's never too late. And that's also what this is about. Yeah. Bringing a lot of heart. Oh, no, yeah. No, thank you very yeah. much. Um, well, there's uh, lots of different concepts and tenants throughout IPMB. You're, you're getting exposed to a few of them there. Um, Mari, would you like to start us off sharing uh, one of the central tenants or concepts that most resonate with you and how mm. you apply it in your work? Um, well, I, um, I started from a very different mindset when I started studying many, many years ago. And I've been building on it ever since, but I've always felt that there was something, there was something crucial um, interfering with being able to put mind body together. Being trained as a physician assistant and also as a therapist, I kept trying to figure out how can I actually integrate the two? Because I so believe that that's where, that's where it was at. And it's really um, interpersonal neurobiology that came across and was like, oh, okay, this is what's threading it all together. That it really is um, whole mind body. And the, that when we talk about our, our neurons and there are more neurons in our belly and in our, in our heart than there are in our brain, it's, it's ascending, not descending. So, I mean, just that whole idea of that there, you know, I have, ner my nervous system is in my hands and in my skin and in my feet. And all those are ways that I can, I can communicate with myself and with the world to me is phenomenal. So I think that if I were to choose one little piece, it, it would be that. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I always loved that. Um, complete opposite of what I've studied in anatomy and physiology oh, yeah. years ago around yeah. the ascending and descending and all of the input the, the, or right. impact of the enteric nervous system and that yeah. gut brain access. Um, more and more mm -hmm. is coming out on that all the time and phenomenal opportunities to heal and, and support. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Maureen, what would you say are, is one of the main or a couple of main tenets or concepts that you apply in your work? Yeah, probably the one that resonates with me um, and maybe does kind of flow from, from my interest in complexity theory is um, how Dan Siegel talks about integration and, and that it, it, is, um, it requires the linkage of differentiated parts. And it's meaningful to me um, because I feel like we either separate and silo or we merge mm -hmm. so often. And I think this gives us the, the way to understand how differentiating parts is so critical. Like we all have a really critical part to play. Mm -hmm. But interpersonal neurobiology goes beyond that and says that it's the linkage that creates the integration. And this is the basis of well being in um, Dan Siegel's explanation of it, if you will. Um, and that to me is a really, um, it's a beautiful concept. And then to realize that it's the same way cells work and neurons work and the circuitry of the brain to realize they differentiate and then connect. It's not that they become one blob, mm -hmm. it's that they become something greater than themselves. And in fact, cannot live without the connection with other neurons and building into circuits. And to the degree that those circuits become complex and connected, there's greater richness in the capacity um, 
you know, to be, to be a human organism. And then I think that that's just replicated in relationships and interpersonal neurobiology says, you don't, you can't separate those two things. They're all connected that those circuits in the, in the brain are directly related to the relationships that will happen in the outside world. And, and we see this in ways that are both the good and the bad of it, where people um, who are impoverished, people who are isolated in their communities, people who are marginalized by dominant culture, they don't flourish the way people who have connections and networks um, in, um, and access to opportunities and resources, they flourish. And so what the brain does, so does the human organism and so do our social networks. And, I just think interpersonal neurobiology gives us that basic concept of integration as the linkage of differentiated parts that we can expand and apply in so many different ways we approach this issue, whether it's the brain or the relationship or the family or the community, um, that those to me are very helpful. So as a therapist, I can sit with a family, I can use that same concept. As an educator, I can help students understand complex social issues. Mm -hmm. um, I can help them understand collaboration by applying that same concept. So for me, that's, um, you know, I love all the things we could go on and on about some of the tenets that are meaningful, but that was one that um, you know, kind of captures my imagination. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so one of the bullets on, on the slide here references inclusive of all ways of knowing. Um, what do you think, how would you describe what we mean when we, we're saying that, uh, all ways of knowing? I, I think that's what we've been both talking about in terms of yeah. um, drawing from all different disciplines, drawing from all different ages, cultures, socioeconomic levels, all these things, we all have something mm -hmm. to offer. And finding a way to bridge it and make meaning out of it, I think, is is really what this is about. Mm -hmm. And well, I would add that uh, that Dan, I would add that Dan um, really has has a complete model on this also that goes uh, you know really in fascinating directions. Um, but that we all come from a plane of possibility that unites us, mm -hmm. and yet all of us have a way of knowing. And we have knowns, you know, like, like I, as you know, I can know how to get from San Jose to Portland. I can know things about being a therapist or systems theory. I can know these things, but to the degree that I get locked in what I know as a fact takes me further away from what unites us in the, in the plane of possibility, as he calls it. And this is based on quantum physics. This is the fascinating thing It's like, we don't even have to be um, you know, math nerds to really kind of start to apply these things that are fascinating. And um, so that, so he talks about, you know, we can get to these peaks of knowing, but we need to also be able to hold those lightly. Um, so what is known as a fact versus the process of knowing can bring us back to that way of seeing how different people know different things in different ways of knowing from different orientations to the world, that once we get back to that plane of possibility through mindfulness, through um, deep listening, through um, uh, empathy, through ways of being together on that plane of possibility, how new things can emerge. So I think, um, you know, it's kind of, you get into the program, you start to realize that something can mean so many different things. And, and, and the, um, the way those come together with people is really, it's exciting stuff. Yeah, really is. Thank you. Okay. So, who can benefit from interpersonal neurobiology and where can it be applied? I mean, there's the... Well, there's the quick answer. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it really is something that, that everyone can benefit from. And, you know, from a personal point in terms of, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, being a parent, and that it's so important to be able to help people, help children cultivate all of who they are, to be able to recognize what's going on for each of them and to be able to read themselves really well and then act, you know, act accordingly. Mm -hmm. So I think it starts with being a person in the world and wanting to know more about the relationship of who I am, where I come from, my inner parts, mm -hmm. how I relate to the environment and the people around me. So I think the quick answer is the best answer. <laughs> yes, anyone, everyone and everywhere, absolutely. Um, you see a list there of many of the professions that have taken this program and applied it in, in many different ways. Um, so psychotherapists, educators, coaches, we've had 
lawyers, um, law enforcement officers, managers, business has tremendous application to this as they are creating new ways of supporting teams and, mm -hmm. and working together, especially as the world gets busier and more people are working uh, from home or telecommuting and different things. So lots yeah. of ways to help, um, help build connection and, and grow together. I think one of the areas I've done a lot of work in is with health healthcare professionals and that they are open to um, really learning how to better connect with their with their patients mm -hmm. and with each other. And this is a model that they can utilize with credibility because it has a scientific basis yes. that um, to actually connect better and therefore get not only better compliance, i.e. <laughs> patients do what they are asked to do, but people get well. Yes. better if they feel like they're being connected to. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing I just wanted to bring up um, briefly is that also organizational development, any kind of oh, organizations yes. can really benefit from interpersonal neurobiology in terms of learning how to read themselves and each other, learning where, where they may be um, triggered or they may be more reactionary than responsive, which we know if you're reactionary, you're probably not going to get the result that you want, <laughs> right. but you might be able to come together and have some kind of um, mediated result if you're able to respond. So it's a it, there are tools in this tool chest that can be utilized in any kind of setting. Yes, and you will leave with an amazing array of tools and, <laughs> and more and more all the time as people find new ways of putting some of this together and yeah. the research continues yeah. to, to grow. So yeah, thank you. And Marie? I think, uh, yeah, I just think a, a quick point to add to that. I think that was well said, um, but all I would add is that the, it's the excitement of all those different people coming together that makes the IPNB program itself good. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that it's a cohort. cohort. Um, it wouldn't be as interesting if, if one cohort was all spiritual counselors or, or all psychotherapists or all educators. What's really phenomenal is to be in a cohort where you see how people can apply these to their very different experiences and, and see our own consilience, you know, to see that there are the same findings, to see that there's just fascinating convergence as people apply them in their own lives. So, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I find so exciting about this field is how I see it everywhere. I mean, you've both referenced several different places where it applies, but I see this application all the time in the news or when I'm uh, reading articles. Uh, people are finding ways to tease out uh, and apply this to very targeted areas um, and what they're doing. And it gives me so much hope when, when there are some of the stories that we're facing uh, to know that there's a lot of tools out there to support people in growing through some of the challenging times and finding wholeness and connectivity in really genuine ways. So, um, yeah, so glad. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would just add to that, that I think that um, just looking at the last 50 years that we have, we post-World War II became very siloed and specialized. And you can especially see this in medicine. And so what one of the things that's so exciting about this is that there's integration on all levels. Mm -hmm. And that to be siloed, that we really lose something in that translation. So to be more integrative, this is an area where it's it's all about integration, but it's also integration completely in our in our culture too. So mm -hmm. I think it it reflects that. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and from what I hear from several of our graduates, uh, many people come into this uh, program because they're wanting to figure out some professional application, be they managers or uh, therapists or body workers or uh, lawyers. I mean, we've had uh, educators have been uh, very, very common as well, uh, law enforcement, uh, social services so many people that are looking for better ways to do their work and connect um, with their clients and, and the people in their field and grow through that, uh, find IPNB and find a lot of benefit from it. What astounds me though, is as much as they find that, uh, those tools and that application and all the continuing ed, it, are the stories they tell me afterwards about how it impacted their family. They brought it home and the difference it made with their children or with their husbands. And, and we've already heard Mari talk a lot about uh, the impact in parenting and, and Maureen as well about how it served in her life. Um, but I did just wanna 
have a slide here referencing the fact that there is such a, a broad application. This becomes something that people really own and integrate and becomes their, their lens for approaching the world and things. So it's a very growing and integrative um, field and there's so much to build upon mm -hmm. in everywhere uh, that we go. Research is continuing to expand. It's, it's amazing how much is changing. I just came uh, off a four day retreat in interpersonal neurobiology with um, one of the teachers who's in this area. And just what she has learned in the last year is phenomenal. So, I mean, I'm excited about teaching it this year and being able to offer much more of my own learning that I've done. So it's a very dynamic growing um, field. I won't even say discipline, but really field. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, being uh, somebody who does the last class on connections, um, I have the opportunity to see how people bring these things together um, in their, their learning. But I think it's, it's worth also noting that, that the program does um, invite people into both the personal and the professional so that that gets integrated, um, knowing that growth and integration come through being able to apply it across domains. And so things like mindfulness are part of the program and as well as the understanding of the science of neurobiology, you know, so it's, it's not just one or the other, but it invites people to that to explore those different ways of knowing themselves and knowing the world better and then integrating them into a meaningful connection with themselves and, and their communities. Great. Thank you. Um. And there's so much more to this as well. What, through interpersonal neurobiology, you get to be connected to a much larger community. Uh, one of our instructors, uh, Deborah Pierce McCall, helped found GAINS, the International uh, Organization uh, of Interpersonal Neurobiology, a professional association. And as such, uh, joining this program, you become a student and can go for the student right to their annual conference. So something people like to take advantage of for sure. Uh, there's a lot of texts and resources out there more and more all the time uh, but one of the most popular areas uh, to find these is the Norton uh, series on IPNB and we use some of those textbooks in in our program and course here uh, various teachers uh, workshops consultation groups uh, more and more I'm seeing it out there and so the chance to tie in and and uh, connect and grow through these uh, specific to your field or um, or just to continue your own, own growth uh, are certainly uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. As Mari mentioned, she just did a training. And so the learning uh, just continues with that. Anything you guys would like to share on that? I think for me, um, once you get this foundation, it you kind of see it everywhere. It's hard to separate. So I know sometimes we get into conversations. It's like, would that be interpersonal neurobiology or how would we describe that? Is it a branch of neuroscience? Is it affective neuroscience? You know, all of a sudden the boundaries blur, but in a meaningful way, I think. So um, I, I think getting this foundation of understanding interpersonal neurobiology and the concepts that allow us as, as the framework, allow us to hold a lot of complexity it allows us to not see professions as, as discrete, but also to see more because of the understanding we have about the brain, about what the mind is, um, about how relationships are formed, um, how they change, how they can be transformed, how mindfulness can be a part of that, um, as well as collective mindfulness. So I feel like it, it provides a foundation that, that um, has allowed me to see things I don't think I ever would have seen before, not just connections, but even new, new ways of knowing, as they say. So I wanted to add that um, an area that I think is one very dear to many of our hearts is one of social justice. And I think that people are realizing that when they are in a place where they feel uncertain or they feel fearful, that it really impacts the whole. And by looking at it through the lens of the brain, um, we're learning amazing things. I have one very teeny example of, we know that the part of the brain is called the amygdala that fires up and when uh, it thinks that you're in danger, or mine fires up when it thinks I'm in danger. And so they have done lots of experiments about what happens when you're walking down the street and somebody smiles at you. And what they found by doing functional MRIs is that 
if someone is fearful, let's say they're in a neighborhood they're not accustomed to being in and they're feeling some fear about that, um, that if somebody walks by and simply smiles at them quickly, their amygdala, actually the cortisol goes down, the amygdala fires less. So, I mean, that's a very teeny little example, but it's phenomenal how many of those examples there are. So that in terms of those people who are involved in social justice or um, sociology of any sort, that this information is one that we can integrate into our everyday lives and our work. Uh, so as you might have already concluded, we have a very unique program here. <laughs> Foundations of IPMD at, at PCC is taught by expert faculty, bringing you a lot of the latest and greatest information. Uh, as you may know, this is a program that we really work to create a, a, a way for everyone to have access to it as much as possible. So we, and we wanted to make it as interpersonal as possible, recognizing that distance uh, may be a factor. So we uh, have developed it as a live streamed uh, program. Once a week, everyone gets together, ideally everyone on a Tuesday evening for the live stream portion of the class. And all of those are, uh, all of those live stream classes are recorded so that should you want to review the information or if somebody needed to miss that class, they can still uh, be fully immersed in the discussions that took place and the content that was shared. Um, we have an experiential in-person component as well, uh, and it is a four-day in-person intensive. Um, we really have had students from around the, the country uh, for some of our other specialty programs. We've had international students uh, come in to study IPMB and things. So uh, we wanted everybody to get a chance to be in the same room together at least once throughout the program. And so we ask you all to travel to Portland, Oregon for that four day in person uh, component. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. And uh, it's open to um, a variety of students and professionals. And as you already heard, there's, there's quite a broad application to that. Um, Mara, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I, except that I was delighted when um, I first met the last class face-to-face -face that um, they had been in contact with each other over Zoom and so forth for some time. But I got to have the experience of them meeting each other face to face. And it was, it was really fun that there was already a sense of relationship between all of them that deepened very, very quickly. And that even that first morning. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Um, and uh, the relationships are forged not just during the live streamed classes, but also through online discussion posts and things. Uh, students are encouraged and, and often required for some of the classes to engage in different discussions with each other throughout that week. So in between the Tuesday evening classes, you're getting to explore and integrate some of the topics and delve into them and the instructors are facilitating and probing with some more questions or sharing their insights and perspectives on some of this. So um, Amy, how uh, large are cohorts typically? Uh, we try to keep them fairly small. So anywhere between uh, 12 to 24 students are, are the most that we, we strive for there. We really want to make sure that everyone gets time to share and, and talk during the class and things. So. Great. Uh, the program is a six month program. So in our world of academia, that is, takes two terms to complete. Uh, it is cohort based, which we was very intentional in that design. Uh, we wanted to give everyone a safe space to grow together and share and develop relationships, many of which they've continued on after the fact, uh, sharing and with each other uh, afterwards and things. Um, looked like you had something to share. No, it's okay. Yeah, I, I had was thinking that my when I took the curriculum, it was there was not one cohort, and so I think this is a great idea that you have a cohort. It fits with interpersonal neurobiology. Yes, <laughs> was part of it. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as I mentioned, it is a special hybrid program. So we have the virtual classrooms uh, utilizing Zoom as their primary platform. And that is integrated into another learning platform, Desire to Learn, uh, where all of the content is housed. So the instructors share their presentations, assignments, uh, those discussion posts, 
class calendars, links to the Zoom room, Zoom recordings, all of that is contained for you in a very nice package uh, online there in, in Desire to Learn. Uh, and then the recordings are up throughout the entire program so that if you, you want to go back and you're talking about uh, the attachment and trauma and you wanted to recall what was taught during the science portion about some of the neurophysiology of what's going on in the brain or the hormonal aspects of it, you can go back and revisit that if you'd like, um, as well as the general uh, content that was shared during that time. Uh, and then um, this is also taught through a flipped curriculum. Uh, so we, we really want to use the class time to uh, be sharing and integrating concepts and deepening within those discussions. So each of the instructors will have a pre-assignments for people. Uh, I remember they attempted this somewhat when I was in college, but it was uh, not always the, <laughs> the actual practice there. Uh, but we do really invite everyone to read the articles or textbook portions ahead of time so that the instructors using that uh, class time could work with you and teach you about that and ask questions and, and bring the material more to life rather than being more of a lecture style and introducing you to the concepts and things. Maureen or Maury, do you have anything to share on, on some of that? Yeah, I think um, the, the um, idea of participation is one that people have to get comfortable with a little bit, um, being online and yet still thinking of it being participatory. Um, and mine is fully online. So the only chance I have to meet the um, cohort in person is to come to, um, you know, when, when people are together, it's not for my class. And, um, I, you know, I think it's, it's an opportunity to kind of jump in and, um, and, and really participate fully. So I think it's, it is, it is the way that, that people can learn. I, I, I think that ability to do in, on your own time, what can be done on our own time, you know, which watching a, you know, a documentary or a video or read or, read or whatever allows us to come more fully together. So I really like the flip design of this. I would add also that um, I think it's great for people to put in ideas about other articles or books or um, TED Talks that they've seen that they thought would be um, exemplary. And so, for, so we're all learning from each other too. I think that's a great part of the program. Absolutely, and all of the instructors strongly encourage that kind of sharing. The resources that I've seen shared and that come out of this are, are really phenomenal because everyone's coming with a slightly different area of expertise and. Um, areas that they're they're tuned into and so to get to see everyone learning from each other is really really special uh, all right so this is a 125 hour uh, CEU program we pack it in more CEUs than most people need in, in the course of the years so we've got here listed all of the course terms there and and all the courses within each term uh, starting with the introduction to IPMB yeah, the introduction to IPMB is a great course. Um, in fact, I, I met with Casey, who's an awesome instructor, incredibly dynamic, and his personality is goes right along with it. He's enthusiastic. He's just super fun. But he really gives this great foundation for IPNB. I mean, when I met with him, I was kind of curious because I felt like, um, you know, kind of like Mari, I took it when it wasn't a cohort. So we took it piecemeal. And so we wouldn't necessarily get the foundation all at one time. And, um, and that was true for Casey too. That's when he, how he took it. And he did such a beautiful job, I thought, of pulling together those core concepts that really allow you to kind of create a concept map of these ideas and then branch them off into your own interpretations and, and applications um, so that that, uh, that intro course um, really sets us up for the key concepts that make up kind of this framework or field, however we want to describe it, um, of interpersonal neurobiology, that, w that then we can pin things like the science, the neuroscience, the physiology, the trauma, the effects um, on, on the body and the brain and the relationships. Um, and then it allows us to really go that next step in understanding ethical perspectives, as well as giving us that language for diversity, marginalization, oppression that takes on a new life, you know? So that introduction gives that foundation that I think is really powerful. Absolutely. 
uh, Casey is really dynamic. He makes class a lot of fun and really does work hard to bring all of the, the concepts uh, to life in really unique ways. He uh, will play his guitar and he'll be uh, working with models and having you draw and um, bring in a lot of the, some of the things on social media that were hotly debated uh, over time that just prove that people's brains are processing things differently. And so how do we approach a lot of this and things? So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So after the intro class, which is five weeks, uh, you get to spend with Casey, then uh, we make sure that you get your ethics in there. So you have two weeks with Deborah Pierce McCall. Um, Deborah studied and has been longtime friends with Dan Siegel. Uh, she is the instructor I referenced who also started GAINS, um, the uh, Global Association for Interpersonal Neurobiology. And she comes with such a Rich, well, rich, yeah. Yeah. rich, rich background and, and passion for IPNB that um, that comes through there. So we just had to make sure you got a chance to meet her, uh, even though you just get a couple of weeks with her. But you mm -hmm. get to learn an, a new framework for for ethics and things in there. Yeah. So yeah. she she taught my ethics course many years ago. Oh, she did, yeah. and um, she really uh, teases out great people's questions. She's she really um, supports your curiosity, but it's, she gets to places, I don't know how she gets there, but she's very, very good. Yeah, and the, the ethics is such a, it's, a, it's just a fascinating world now with the advent of um, artificial intelligence, and she even gets into that. Um, and again, it links those to the concepts um, of interpersonal neurobiology. So it's, it's really, it's, it's, it really gives us a broader uh, picture of ethics. Uh, after you complete those two classes, uh, you, you'll be uh, sharing some time around the science of IPNB. So we have uh, one main instructor for that and then uh, a medical doctor as well who assists in that class. So uh, get to get all into the brain science and uh, learn all of the neurophysiology. Uh, this portion, when you come together for the four-day in-person intensive, is where we will have a, uh, a brain dissection section so that you'll actually get to be hands-on seeing these portions of the brain and, and going through there. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> we, should, we should add that it's a sheep's brain, not a human brain. Yes, <laughs> it is a sheep's brain. So we have it's a about, model of a human, but <laughs> it's also the size of your fist. Yeah, it's about that big. So yeah. not too scary to go into yeah. it. So lots to cover within the science, um, a tremendous amount of knowledge there. And uh, as the uh, MD who co teaches this has expressed, she said, What I teach through this class is something that my neurosurgeon peers have, have no idea about. It's just not part of their, um, their paradigm for practicing. So you get a really unique perspective on a lot of this and highly applicable there to everything else that you'll be learning uh, in the rest of the program. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, and then the second part, uh, foundations term two, um, IPNB of attachment and trauma is taught by Alyssa Baggin who, um, took many of the courses with me and also was um, we were in consult groups with Bonnie Badenoch who's written books on attachment and the brain brain wise therapist you may have seen and Alyssa is um, she's a wonderful teacher she knows this inside out and backwards and uh, she's a therapist at Western Psychological has been for many years um, and her sense of her use of attachment and really realizing the implications of how it impacts us. So attachment from um, our probably about the seventh month of gestation up through our formative years and then how that trauma from attachment too um, can impact our life. So uh, how, we, how we are in the world, how we interpret other people, um, how we relate in terms of groups and also our own families. She does an excellent job with it. Yes. So. And sitting next to me, we have our difference in diversity instructor as well. So I'll let you share a little about your class. Um, this is a very important area for me. I came from it from first the intercultural communication. So I try to incorporate um, some learning about what, uh, what is interculturalism and how do we look at people who are, we see as different different than us, the little radar goes up. 
And um, so to really give us some tools in terms of how to interpret different cultures, how to interpret different overall. And cultures includes any kind of marginalized groups, um, and then which are incorporated in diversity. And then to look at, with unconscious bias, what's going on with the brain and what's going on with all the parts of this that we've embedded from intergenerational trauma to our own attachment and trauma and then our, the, our cultures of family. Um, so it's a way of integrating at least three different fields. Relational mindfulness is our um, is another class that we have that is taught by a rolfer, uh, which is uh, a version of body work. So somebody who's really specially trained in not just massage therapy, but in how trauma is stored in some of the tissue and how you can work through that and, and engage that. So he's teaching you a lot of the mindfulness uh, side of it, of IPMB, as well as how how we're embodying that and what we can do about that and working through that. Um, I should add that mindfulness is a theme throughout all of our and uh, many instructors will be working with mindfulness concepts and practices, but they'll all be doing it in a slightly different way to help you add more tools to your toolbox and things. Um, Maureen, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think that that captures it. Great, or Maureen? Okay, great. Well, I'll next ask Maureen to share because she is the instructor that gets to help wrap all this together at the end and helping you identify ways to um, bring the material and everything you've studied out into to your world and things. And I think that, that kind of captures it, except to say just that, that it really is the capstone project class. Um, we talk about um, how you've begun to integrate the concepts for yourself and connect them um, both personally and professionally and how you will extend those into the communities of your life and your spheres of influence. Um, and then you're asked in this final class to do um, a Be the Change You Want to See um, capstone project where you will then take the stage in the, in the class and share with people the concepts that you have integrated and any kind of emergent model, any way of making sense of the concepts for yourself and the application. And, um, you know, people were nervous about this when they first got into it. Uh, but people really got into it and it really was a powerful class as people start to started to bring their ideas together and really take the time to present their ideas and how they made sense to them because again kind of going back to that idea of complexity there's a lot of different um, sort of models and and certainly science that are are provided and some guidance on you know here these are the foundations that will help you see things differently really and in the capstone, it gives you the time to bring those together for yourself. And it's so cool to see how different people will take the same information. And yet, because the integration is different for them, because that linkage of disparate parts is different for them, that it takes on this, this real unique beauty that everybody was able to share in. And then the discussions that came around that project was really a lot of fun. So the very last cl class that we participated in was people being able to present their integration of concepts over the course. So I would say it's probably good to know that going into the program because you can kind of take notes and do that um, that branching con um, kind of concept map for yourself to see how these ideas are coming together and being applied in your own um, personal and professional lives. So that's kind of how the connection class goes. I, I watch the um, program as it unfolds okay. and pick up on um, key things that the cohort itself is picking up on. So the connections class is pretty fluid depending upon what's meaningful uh, to the cohort and what maybe are some ways to um, illuminate a little bit more the connections they're making as a cohort. So I get to do that piece of it, which is, um, is kind of listen and learn as cohorts are, are evolving in their own culture of the program. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna zip through a little bit of this as I think you already have a good sense of it. Um, so you just got to hear all of the courses that are taught throughout the six month program. Uh, oh, half of those pro courses, four of the seven, uh, include time during our in-person intensive here. So this for this cohort, that intensive will take place January 30th to February 2nd. Uh, so that's a Thursday through a 
um, Sunday and it's located here in Portland, Oregon. So you get to plan a trip to the Northwest if you don't already live here. Some people like to stay an extra few days to enjoy some of the seasonal options. We certainly have Mount Hood for skiing and snowshoeing. Um, other times of year, the coast is, is a favorite destination, mm -hmm. although it's surprisingly nice in the winter as well to, to cuddle up there. Um, and lots to do, of course, in Portland itself. So come enjoy. We try to balance the day a little, days a little bit so that you do have some time to explore and go get some of the good food that Portland is known for or go check out a couple of your favorite sites. Uh, so you spend six to eight hours in class each day, uh, typically more like six, but we do have uh, one day that is, is longer there. And then there's always a lunch break built in. Um, the classes are almost, are mostly held at the Climb Center, which is very centrally located in Portland, uh, just north of the OMSI, or the Oregon Science um, Museum, or Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, and we are a one building center, so it's very simple and easy to find and access, and we have plenty of parking, which depending where you're coming from, uh, you may may really appreciate that. <laughs> so, um, and then we always enjoy Saturday evenings uh, just to get together and relax and, and hang out together some. Uh, there we have a, a faculty and student dinner. Uh, it's optional, but almost everybody, everybody comes mm -hmm. uh, as long as they can and um, come and share. We've even had people bring their spouses and children that because they were so excited having shared so much of the information that they got the rest of their family excited about it. So um, we've had had it be a, a beautiful opportunity for people just to get together and connect. And we do have a fun, fun little activity that we do there uh, that you will learn more about during your class with Casey. I give him full credit for helping create this, um, this special opportunity with you guys. Um, but it becomes a really sweet time just to hang out and be together. Um, so the investment in our program is, um, is uh, 23 weeks and then of course uh, approximately uh, one live session a week. We build breaks in and everything for you there. Uh, with this, these are college level classes. Uh, some of the material was, is a master's level. Um, we create tiered assignments so that depending on your background and knowledge, uh, somebody who's perhaps a law enforcement officer uh, probably hasn't had the depth of, of brain science that perhaps a psychologist has. So we, the instructors work to create, where appropriate, different levels of assignments that uh, you can self-select into to appropriately challenge yourself. So we really work to make sure that everyone gets to engage to the levels and depth that they want. Um, but all that takes a little time. So being college level classes, we always encourage people to plan one to three hours of study time and prep time and reading for every hour of class time that you that you are having there. Uh, we've already talked about the online discussion boards and the in-person intensive. Uh, and so Amy, Amy could you um, address what happens if somebody's not able to make the um, in-person intensive? Um, would that prevent someone from participating in the program? How would it, you address it would prevent them more than likely from being able to successfully complete that term of the program from a grade perspective um, because of some of the assignments and hours. Um, as much as we work to record and, and create the online learning opportunity for people on a week to week basis, that four day in person intensive does not have any uh, recording capabilities or, or opportunities there to make them up. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a really, really important date to try to set aside. Um, we have had people that could only come for part of it. One, one student was able to do that, so we were able to assign the grades appropriately in that um, instance and things. Um, uh, so contact me outside and we can talk about your circumstance and things. Um, but for the most part, yeah, we really encourage um, everyone to come live there and try to block that side, time aside so that you can immerse yourself with all these wonderful instructors and your peers and, and the material that you're studying and things. So. I see another question there. Um, I'll let... Uh, yeah, and I, I think um, I, I can jump in as 
Mari's thinking a little bit about it, um, okay. is that... summarize okay. the question for everyone here. So uh, we have somebody that's excited about the program in the field, uh, but they're struggling with a little bit of how to apply it as a practice and career. So I think Maureen's going to share her thoughts on that now. Yeah, just some early thoughts. I think Mari will have more to, to say. Um, um, early childhood education, early childhood development is a very um, direct application. One of the required um, textbooks, in fact, Luke Cozzolino directly is going to be addressing early childhood development and education. So um, I, I think um, of, the, of the careers, there's going to be a real fundamental interest for somebody um, um, with your background. And um, uh, Lisa, and as you come to that crossroads, I think this is the kind of program that would help you uh, you know, maybe make a decision about which way you wanted to go with that basic training that you have, the background in Montessori and childhood education. I think you would be very excited about the, found, fun, the foundational knowledge that you'll gain from brain to relationships to attachment to childhood development, things you already know, but how to take the foundation you have and, uh, and um, extend extend that, you may find new pathways if, if it's truly a crossroads that you're, you're facing that maybe you're looking for a new path. So that's what I would say is just that foundation is going to be there to, to let you take your foundational knowledge to a, another level. I would like to just add that last year um, in the last cohort, there was a person who was an early childhood um, educator and she was absolutely blown away by the content of the course. And I just wanted, wish that I had small children that could go to her classroom. Um, <laughs> it was a very good uh, marriage between what she already knew and what she was gleaning from the course. Yes. Uh, I remember speaking to another uh, instructor a few years ago who worked with uh, young children, kindergarten or first graders. And she talked about, um, having a, a lot of faith, pretty good sense that taking some of the tools that she learned, which were rich, but she said, I'm just going to focus on the mindfulness and some self-awareness and work with my, um, with her classroom and, and the students she had around that. And she said, it completely transformed her classroom experience. She knew it was having an impact, but she had no idea the dramatic difference it would make. Mm -hmm. And not only did it make that difference with her students, but she said the parent interactions were completely mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. as well. So right. um, it, right. it just ripples out yeah. in a really beautiful way. So yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question about uh, earning the certificate. And uh, yes, so by completing both terms of the program, each term gets recorded on your transcript separately. So that's when I was referencing the grades portion of it. But by successfully completing each term of the program, you earn what is called a non-credit training certificate. And this is a certificate that we've um, gotten vetted through the state of Oregon and it's registered with the state. And you'll also get a certificate that you can hang on your wall and things. And all of this is transcripted so that you do have all of the CEUs for that. Uh, as far as the benefits from having that certificate, uh, it really can depend on the field. Um, I think for some people, it can really be a boost to their resume, give them some talking points in job interviews, give them uh, unique ways to apply the knowledge. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And really make it their own. Um, uh, we have one instructor that uh, came to this with a social work background, but through marrying that with her own personal life experience in starting a family, uh, she has developed a great expertise in the interpersonal neurobiology for perinatal mood disorder and birth trauma, and is now teaching that uh, through us, as well as starting to present that at conferences, and I suspect is really going to be building um, an expertise in that that will be well sought after and things. Um, do you have anything to add? Well, I would just say that, you know, having um, already um, sort of a two or three prong occupations that what this has done for me is it really offers credibility, especially when I'm working with um, diversity and difference to be able to bring in the interpersonal neurobiology allows people sometimes to hear things that are um, to deal with things that are difficult to deal with. So I think it really has, I definitely integrated it and it has offered a credibility that I think makes um, this work easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Any other? Okay, and Maureen may share a little bit more, but unfortunately she's got a little background noise right now. So, uh, but yes, I think a lot of people have found that it's a really, uh, a really nice boost to, to the work that they're doing. Uh, I would not, uh, it, this is the certificate alone is not going to get you a job though. This is something that complements the other work and, and background and skills that you have, uh, but it really can be a very marketable uh, aspect to that yeah. and things. So yeah, this is not a standalone though. I do think though that certificate programs are sort of the, the trend yeah, nowadays. Very much so. And, and it does signify that you have um, been uh, assessed that you've taken a specific amount of um, courses at what those courses are and that someone has overseen it so it's not just that you've done your own research so yeah. I really do think it is the trend these days it is uh, in some fields much more than others um, software industry for instance uh, certificates are, are more important than degrees in, in some instances yeah. they're they're vetting that you know Mm -hmm. uh, have achieved a level of skill and expertise. And this is yeah. one more example of how to do that. So, yeah. All right. Uh, so many people are interested in how much the program costs. If you haven't already found that online, uh, it is $29.50 for the whole program. So that is inclusive of both terms. Now, to because we are tied to the college systems, we've come up with some creative options to give you some uh, unique payment plans that are not offered to our other students. So we front load all of that tuition um, at the beginning of the program, which means that tuition will be charged for the first term and your tuition for the second term will be zero dollars uh, and that way it averages out and that allows you to access a special interest-free payment plan where you would be uh, making payments over the full six months of the program it was the most affordable way we could create a payment plan for you um, as of the last time I checked that uh, looks like putting 20% down and then equal payments uh, after that. I believe there historically has been a $25 fee to set that payment plan up, but again, for interest-free money, it's, it's a pretty great way to go. And then there are five books that you'll be invited to purchase or borrow from friends in the library or things there. Uh, you do not have to buy those books from uh, our bookstore or anything. Once you're registered, I will send you the list of books and you can go purchase them from wherever you would like um, and things. And some next steps here. Uh, so hopefully you are excited and planning to register. Registration opens next Wednesday, August 14th. Uh, before that, no, you can go and start your PCC application. It's uh, simply filling that out and putting it into the system so that they can generate a number, uh, a student ID for you and create an email account for you and all kinds of back-end support there. Uh, there is a manual portion to that process though because uh, we're really committed to protecting your identity and so it can take a little bit of time, especially leading up to the start of the fall term. Uh, so I encourage you to give to start that sooner than later. Now would be great because uh, it can generally take three to five days for that process to complete and for them to send you your ID number. Once you have your ID number, you can register online and or you can uh, call and register over the phone as well. So uh, the registration or number that you would use, uh, course registration number or CRN is at the bottom of the page, 47701. And I've also included the link for you to go and start that application process. Uh, we will create a student um, email account that is Google-based for you. So a lot of people really like that and are very familiar with that. Uh, it's got unlimited storage and is good for two years after your last class as well. So, um, so that's a real boost for people. And also being a PCC student, you get access to all of the other benefits that students do as far as using the library, gym if you're in the area, um, going to any of the lectures and programs and things that we offer here as well. Um, and we are going to have a special uh, student orientation on Thursday, September 19th. So I will be leading that and uh, we'll have 
hopefully have as many people can join as possible so you can introduce yourself to each other and and um, know a little more who's in the class but during that time i'll go through that some of the technology um, there's opportunities i always encourage you to review some of that beforehand because um, that repeat exposure is a great way to become really comfortable and familiar with it but i'll show you a little bit of of the programs that we're using and, and where to go to find some of the links and content and all of that good stuff and then the first class will begin the following tuesday on september 24th with casey uh, i do have a detailed timeline for anyone that is eager for that otherwise i'll send that to you with registration and things um, so any questions that anyone has we have uh, 13 minutes left to honor our, our original time and of course i'm always happy to answer questions or connect you um, with instructors as needed to get all of your your questions answered so if you do have a question we can unmute you if you wanted to ask it live or you can certainly type it in the chat box as well all right maureen has it quieted enough out there is there anything you wanted to add yeah, uh, I don't. I think you've covered the things that um, that I was thinking about, and I was just actually, as you were asking for questions, I was trying to think, Ash, would, you know, are there any things that I, I feel like I, still is a gap for me? But no, I would welcome any questions, but no, I, I uh, don't have any additional comments. Great, thanks. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, what would I add? And I think just that this is a body of knowledge that is robust and becoming more and more robust and that we need people from all different disciplines to um, be with us on this because I think that we can really make some changes that are important. Absolutely. So even if you're from a, a field of study or a field of work that you might think, oh, is this going to be relevant? I would encourage you to contact Amy and speak to any of us to, and let's talk about it. See if it, see how it would be. Absolutely. Okay. That's a great, great point. Great point. Thank you, Mari. Yes. This is one of those programs I was so excited to help create mm -hmm. because I just knew in my heart that this is yeah. one of the ways to change the world and really, yeah. really help a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any questions coming in, so there's, um, we'll let you guys go enjoy more of your evening. Thank you so much uh, for being with us this evening. My contact information is up there, and most of you have also received emails from me, so you know, you know how to reply back and find me. Um, please let us know what last chance for any questions. You can also raise your hand uh, through Zoom if you if you do have questions, and we can unmute you and call on you there. But I don't see any hands raised. Oh, thank you, Jamie or Jaime. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, it was great spending the evening with you all. Have a wonderful rest of your night. <laughs>